Welcome friends to a lecture on VNTR analysis. I am Dr. Arun Kumar Hare and in this lecture I will be talking to you about what are VNTRs and how do we analyze them. VNTR stands for variable number of tandem repeats. What are tandem repeats? In the DNA it has been found that certain base pairs tend to repeat themselves multiple times in the DNA like AT, GAA, GGA, CAA, CT, it could be any patterns. There could be just one copy of this or at a stretch you could get 10 repeats of AT, AT, AT or 10 repeats of GGA, GGA, GGA like that. These are called tandem repeats. The number of copies of such tandem repeats are usually seen to be varying from person to person. Now because there is significant variation in them, uh, the fragment size gets affected. But these tandem repeats are usually in the non-protein coating regions. Therefore the final protein that is formed does not get affected. Many times it may be the non-coating regions or it may be in the introns. These tandem repeats are scattered randomly in the chromosomes and are generally used as markers for mapping genes in the chromosomes. We inherit one chromosome from each of our parents and along with them we inherit the VNTR patterns from each of these parents. So every individual will be having VNTR patterns which are similar to their parents. This is the concept which is utilized in DNA fingerprinting as well as testing for maternal blood contamination while doing chorionic villus sampling studies. Now to just understand this, let us assume that there is a gene, there is an exome 1 and exome 2 and this is the intron region and in this we have a VNTR. It could be any letters, it could be AT, AT, AT repeats or it could be GGA, GGA repeats, it could be any of these repeats. Now if a person has 5 copies of these repeats, obviously the distance between the exome 1 and the exome 2 will be small and this fragment length will be small. If the person has 50 copies of this tandem repeat, then the distance between exome 1 and exome 2 will be larger. But during the process of protein synthesis, since the introns get spliced and the exons join together, this VNTRs will not affect the final protein which is being formed. Now the strategy for doing VNTR analysis is we use primers that flank the VNTRs and then we amplify the VNTRs. So and then we run an electrophoresis and see the size of the fragments. So what is the fragment size that we expect? The fragment size of a VNTR analysis will consist of the basic number of nucleotides plus the number of nucleotides present in the VNTR into the number of copies of the VNTR. Let us say if we look at the region between the two primers excluding the VNTR region, the number of base pairs present in this that is this blue region would actually be your basic number and this will not vary from persons to persons. The number of repeating nucleotides whether it's two or three is specific to a VNTR and the number of copies present they also vary. So now if we understand this the fragment size that we would get would be the basic number plus the number of nucleotides which are present in the VNTR into the number of copies present in that VNTR. So if the basic number was 200 and the number of the repeats in the VNTR was 3 and we had 20 repeats of such then our product size would be 200 plus 3 into 20 which will be 260. If this concept is clear let us test ourselves with an other situation where the basic number is 200, the VNTR numbers are 3 and there are 50 products. 50 repeats of this. So what is going to be the size of a PCR product? If your answer is 350, congratulations, you have understood the concept. If your number is not 350, I would request you to kindly go back, 
see the calculations and once again come to this magic figure of 350. Assuming that all of you have got this magic figure, let's go to the next step that's the PCR settings. It is just like a normal conventional PCR where we will have the genomic denaturation 94 degrees centigrade for 10 minutes and then the classical PCR cycle settings where you have a denaturation then you have an annealing now this annealing will depend upon which is the PNTR marker you're using and what are the primers you use. So each of the VNTRs you use will have different annealing temperatures. But what is different from the conventional PCR is the chain elongation time. Because we are not sure of the number of repeats. Because we are not sure of how long our fragment length is going to be. We need to cater for that and have a longer chain elongation time. This obviously can be standardized in your lab with your experience depending upon the population in which you are doing. It could be between one minute to one and a half minutes. Then there's a final chain elongation and after you have done that you do the electrophoresis and gel dock to visualize the VNTRs. The results, an individual inherits one chromosome from the father. So so you'd have inherited two different copy numbers of that chromosome. So there would be two VNTR patterns. At any time, the VNTR numbers may be very similar to or slightly different. Uh, at many times, the VNTR copies may be very similar and you may get to see one band. Like for example, here you can see two discrete bands and you know that these are the two VNTR copies one copy this person would have inherited from his father and the other copy he would have inherited from the mother. Now this, there are two copies but the two copies are so close to each other that they appear to be one. Similarly, over here we are finding that there is only one band. It doesn't mean that there is one band. There are two VNTRs but the copy numbers are so small that the resolution of these two, these two bands as two distinct bands in agarose may be difficult. Here you can see the two distinct bands. Now, how do we use VNTR analysis in paternity testing? Now, generally you run the father, uh, you extract the DNA from the father's blood, you extract the DNA from the mother's blood, and then you extract the DNA from the child's blood, and then you analyze the VNTR patterns. Here we are seeing that there are two patterns. There's one over here and one over here, two VNTR patterns from the father. We are just seeing one pattern over here in the mother and we are seeing both the patterns in the child. So you are seeing the father's pattern and you are seeing a band corresponding to the mother's pattern. So this child is a biological child of these two parents. Similarly, if you have a look over here, here you are getting a pattern from the father, here you are getting a pattern from the mother and the child is having two VNTRs, one which corresponds to the mother and one which corresponds to the father. So here we can say that this child is also a biological child of these parents. If you have got any advantageous or many bands which do not correspond to these patterns, then you would say that they are not biologically related. Supposing while doing the VNTRs, in these VNTRs, if both the father and the mother showed a single band, then we would say that this VNTR is not an informative marker and we would try to test other VNTRs to see whether the same pattern exists or not. Now, contamination of chorionic villus sample with maternal blood. This is usually done when we are doing a thalassemia workup or any prenatal work, antenatal workup for checking of genetic disorders. The chorionic villi is collected from the mother and there are chances that during this process some amount of maternal blood would also be present sticking along with this chorionic villi. If adequate care is not taken to separate maternal blood from this chorionic villi, the DNA present in the WBCs of the maternal blood would also get extracted with the chorionic villi and give results which would be pretty confounding and difficult to interpret. More details about how it affects our analysis in thalassemia workup will be discussed in a subsequent lecture. But today what I will be discussing about is how VNTRs can help us identify 
whether maternal blood contamination has occurred in the chorionic villi samples DNA or not. Now what we do over here is similarly we extract the DNA from the father, from the mother and the chorionic villi. The father can have two copies or as we had discussed if the VNTI patterns are very close that could be just one copy. The child, mother could also have a similar situation and the child would definitely be in inheriting the DNAs from the parents. So let's understand this situation. The father's VNTR pattern is like this. The mother's VNTR pattern is like this. When we run the VNTR pattern of the child, we get a pattern like this. Now one of the band corresponds to that of the mother. The other band corresponds to that of the father. So we can say that in this chorionic villi, there was no contamination of maternal blood. This report is highly reliable. However, if we get a pattern like this, you can see that this pattern corresponds to that of the father. This pattern corresponds to that of the mother. So far, so good. But you're seeing that an other band is present which corresponds to the mother. So what you're actually finding over here is that you're getting both the copies of the maternal VNTR pattern in the chorionic villi sample. Now that can occur only and only when the maternal blood conta gets contaminated in the DNA which we are extracting for the chorionic villi. This point is very important and this has profound implications while taking a call in antenatal thalassemia diagnosis. Thank you very much for listening to my lecture and more about antenatal thalassemia diagnosis in the next lecture.